Welcome to the HKS Energy Policy Seminar. I'm Joe Aldi, and I'll serve as the host for our seminar today. Thrilled to have friends and colleagues and students joining us here in the Kennedy School, as well as on Zoom. Uh, for today, we're thrilled to have with us our colleague from the Government Department, Dustin Tingley. Professor Tingley is a professor of government here at Harvard and is the Deputy Vice Provost for Advances in Learning. His research has spanned international relations, international political economy, climate change, causal inference, data science and machine learning, and digital education, with most focus now on the politics of climate change and energy transitions. Notably, he recently co-authored a book, Uncertain Futures, How to Solve the Climate Impasse, published by Cambridge University Press. The book features the voices of those on the front lines of the energy transition. Dustin also chairs Harvard's Standing Committee on Climate Education and co-chairs Harvard FAS Standing Committee on Public Service and Engaged Scholarship. Dustin recently co-authored a university-wide report entitled The Future of Climate Education at Harvard. He's here today for a talk on reimagining net metering, a new polycentric model to expand renewable energy access. Dustin, welcome to the Energy Policy Seminar. Great, thanks so much, Joe, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. <laughs> Right. Um, so really excited to uh, to be here. I'm um, unfortunately oftentimes just at an echo. Uh, oftentimes can't come. Um, could we turn the house volume down? Sort of echoing. Um, or I could move this down a little bit maybe. Um, I, I do watch the uh, YouTube uh, presentations though. Um, and it's really exciting to be here. So before um, talking about this project, um, I just wanted to give a plug. I mean, when Joe asked me to give this talk, um, he suggested doing the book, um, but I had already presented it to some different audiences. Um, but nonetheless, I don't want to give up an opportunity to plug a book that just came out. Um, so, uh, so this book, um, basically, Alex and I, um, we uh, develop a theory about how um, government efforts to help um, communities that are fossil fuel producing regions um, transition, they fundamentally face credible, uh, credible commitment problems, right? Uh, uh, a new administration could be in place in the future. The priorities of the administration could change, et cetera. And so promises um, then uh, face a credibility problem. And then we come up with essentially a set of solutions on what to do about that. Um, and we uh, very much um, draw on a lot of um, voice and interviews and surveys done um, in uh, fossil producing regions in the country. Um, Ernie Moniz, when a former secretary of the energy um, is on the back cover of your book, you, you, you utilize his uh, quotation, which I am doing now. So I'm really excited that this book is out, but I'm here to talk about something very different. And I'm gonna do so with a caveat. So this is a caveat from an email with Joe in responding to his kind invitation where I said, okay, I don't know the style, um, I have this working project, um, uh, but it might be too weird. And I kind of feel that way about this project. <laughs> it's a little bit different than anything I've sort of ever done before. Um, but Joe said, yeah, looks great, let's do it. Um, so let's do it. Um, so this started with um, a couple of motivations. Um, one was that uh, there is a growing literature about disparities in rooftop solar adoption. Um, and uh, essentially the top lines from this work is that it skews wealthy, um, it's often white uh, in the US. Um, and the reasons for this are, are you know, quite broad. So for example, if you're a renter, you might not have the same set of incentives to uh, install uh, rooftop solar than if you're a homeowner and then renting versus homeowning, home, home ownership is correlated with things like wealth and race, et cetera, right? So there's a broad set of sort of reasons why this might happen. Um, furthermore, um, and I'll show you some granular data on this, the public understands this, right? This is not something that is um, surprising. Um, so um, only 23% in a national sample that we did think that uh, low income and non-white groups benefit from solar, uh, rooftop solar here. Um, <laughs> And again, this is um, work that others uh, have done. So we have disparities then in access to a clean energy source. And some would take that even further, which is to say things like, well, that means that these residences um, are then um, you know, more exposed to the sort of local environmental harms that might come with uh, certain types of fossil energy. 
The second motivation um, was around a uh, net metering. And um, I actually got into thinking about this in a conversation with my mom. So um, uh, where she was like, ah, I'm thinking about putting in rooftop solar. How does it work? I have no clue. I go online and it's like Google ads. And, you know, it's very confusing for me. Like, how does it work? Um, and so uh, I explained, well, you know, you can get subsidies or you, there are tax incentives. At the time, she didn't qualify for any of them because she was retired. So there was like no income to give her an incentive. Um, uh, but she, you know, wants to do her part in helping to save the climate. And so I said, yeah, but there's also this net metering thing where if you uh, generate excess electricity that you don't use, um, in some places you can sort of sell that back to the grid. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what her response was to that, but just to introduce this to you here, um, that's basically what net metering is doing. Um, some states allow this um, via credits that you can get on your electricity bill, things like this. It is very contentious, right? Um, there are states that um, effectively try to prevent this as much as possible, could threaten utility monopolies. And there's actually like a really interesting sort of debate here because um, when you are using your rooftop solar, say, to generate elect excess electricity that you're then, in a sense, selling back to the grid, the, the selling of that, your electricity to someone else is taking place on infrastructure that is not your own infrastructure. And this leads to um, a debate about cross-subsidization, right? Where the utility companies are like, we don't really like this because if we pay you the same rate that we're selling the electricity, we're not recovering our costs to sort of um, distribute that electricity more broadly, right? And so if you look across the country in different states, there are really contentious debates about what should be done here. So those of you who are in the weeds, California has the new NEM 3.0. Um, lots of people like rush to get into NEM 2.0 because of different provisions it had on net metering compared to 3.0. Um, uh, uh, and it's a real like bargaining situation between consumers, uh, state regulators and utility companies. And so like what that price is ranging from zero to the actual market price for electricity is um, basically subjected to this debate about cross subsidization. Um, and uh, my personal view is that like many bargaining situations, it's all about somewhere in between um, that you know the utility company has a point, but the price of this shouldn't be zero, right? And how we as society will set that um, uh, in the future is, is up for contention. Um, and so uh, I was thinking about net metering um, uh, and then you know did a little bit of work, like, well, how much, what are we really talking about here? Um, so we did uh, some work digging into uh, different EIA forms. So those of you who work in the energy sector, um, more, much more than I do. Um, you're more familiar with this. It's, it was a big hassle. Um, uh, in 2021, um, uh, about 1.5 million megawatt hours were sold back. Um, if you were to sort of ballpark how much this is worth, um, uh, if you essentially take what the sort of utility state level price is, um, for that, and then multiply this at the state level and aggregate things up, you get to around uh, 200 million. That's certainly an upper bound of what people are earning because that's using what that sort of uh, stated utility state level price was. And we know just by the previous conversation, the utility companies want that to be a lot lower, right? Um, but this is part of the debate. Um, uh, so this is the sort of ballpark of what we're looking at. This is also increasing over time. So if you look at the trends and the total amount of net metering that happens. Um, it's going up in uh, residential, commercial, um, and even industrial, okay? So these are all trending um, upwards. So um, going back to the conversation with my mom, when I said, hey, mom, like, you know, ah, you could make 20 bucks a month selling, and she's all about like not, I mean, she's, you like go and visit with her and she like does not want to heat her home, air conditioning. It's one of those like, <laughs> I don't want to use energy. Um, so she, I'm like, well, you'll, you know, you can maybe make like 30 bucks a month selling this back to the grid. And her response was, you know, honestly, that's not what I'm in it for, right? I'd be in it to do something else with that money. And I'd probably ended up sort of donating that to something. 
And then she told me a story about how my grandparents in New England um, would regularly donate um, to winter oil funds. That this was something that was very common and, and still is common, um, where communities would come together, pull together money to be able to buy oil for local community members that were um, less well off than they. Okay. She's like, well, how about something like that? Like, why can't I just donate it? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, maybe you could donate it. So that led me and Alex to this idea, which is what if in a net metering framework, people who were generating excess energy were able to take those funds and contribute to some mechanism that would then build new or additional renewable energy capacity for low income and un other underserved communities. And that's the underlying idea here, right? That maybe not everyone wants to pocket those excess proceeds um, and would be willing to donate some percentage of them to a sort of a greater good type mission, right? Um, and so um, in thinking through that, which I'll talk about a little bit, you know, there are different literatures um, ranging from like behavioral economics that we might draw on to inform us how we would structure such a program. Um, to uh, you know, Eleanor Ostrom and sort of polycentric design um, about how could we leverage local institutions working alongside utility companies. Um, and in doing so, um, could we perpetually increase renewable build out itself powered by renewable energy? And so when I said like, Joe, I think this talk is a little weird. This is not the sort of you know, typical, like we're gonna set prices and you know, things are gonna clear, et cetera. Um, and so I'm trying to intention push outside the box of thinking on some of this. Um, and of course, this could complement any number of other programs that might be more first order. Like this could be like fifth order in terms of like what's really going to move the needle. But this could be completely complementary to other programs with tax incentives um, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and so uh, what I want to do is introduce a formal model of this, and that's this. Right. Um, this is my extent of, uh, uh, you know, I guess I could subscript this by I and uh, we'd be all, most most of the. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we'd be all the way there. Um, I, my comparative advantages is not in art, um, but this is more or less what this looks like. OK, um, so the other sort of broader motivation is, um, you know, how can we. Um, take things to um, redesign some of the incentive systems that operate within our economy and the sort of broader political economy backdrop. Um, and in particular, can we design non-state-led mechanisms, so very much a sort of a more bottom-up polycentric design type perspectives with what um, my colleague out at Stanford, Margaret Levy calls a, a new moral economy, um, and by that, they mean, how do we mobilize strategies and government arrangements that facilitate pro-social behavior and overcome the divisions, racial, political, and otherwise, that block awareness of common interests? Now, when I see sort of quotations like that, I have two reactions. Um, one is, that sounds great, count me in, kumbaya. And the other is like, like what? <laughs> like, would that work? Is it incentive compatible? Um, but I think the insight here is that um, if we are going to try to think along these lines, that we could try to design programs that um, recognize that people are actually altruistic, right? Um, while not disbanding with the fact that people also are price responsive and have substantial self-interest. Um, that we could draw on some tools from literatures like behavioral economics to think about mechanism design in perhaps new ways, but where the outcomes of these things are for pro-social um, public good um, type outcomes, okay? Um, and so that's the other kind of motivation uh, here uh, for me. So um, what do we do? Uh, we then said, all right, well, we've got an idea. We have a reasonable motivation. Um, uh, let's go out and collect a bunch of data to see um, what this might look like, right? Um, and I'm a political scientist. Um, one of the sources of data that we utilize is um, by running surveys, right? Um, so um, some of this is going to look 
uh, similar to maybe what like a market kind of research firm would do where there is a client that hires them to do this. Um, I am not a market researcher and I don't have the budgets that they did, but um, we did put some resources to this. So um, to give you a kind of a flavor of what we'll talk about, you know, one is just to document, you know, how aware are people to the inequities that we're speaking to? Um, is there a willingness to contribute, right? So if you ask people, you know, would you want to participate in this? What would they say? And there'll be some caveats there, of course. Um, what are the particular program design features that could enhance popularity versus decrease it, right? Um, what are the impacts of some of these more polycentric type designs that Ostrom and others would encourage us to think about? And then finally, given that there is this sort of debate within society about um, you know, where utility companies should come in here, how much should they be able to, uh, or should they be able to buy excess electricity for, that bargaining problem that we were gonna talk about, um, what is the impact of something like this on the favorability ratings of utility companies? And um, as a public opinion researcher, when we go out and ask people's views about the favorability of different institutions and organizations and companies, um, do you think that utility companies come out on top, like you know, right next to Walt Disney, or towards the bottom? What's what's everyone's sense? Do you think towards the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, either towards the bottom. Like these are not, and, and, and you know, which is in some sense kind of sad because they provide, you know, a resource that we depend on here, right? Um, yet they don't come out too favorably. And so maybe something like this would actually make them look good for once if they were able to support this and, and buy in and, and be partners. Um, so um, I, let me start with perceptions of energy inequities. Um, so this was just, um, asking people to what extent do you think the following have benefited from the expansion of solar panels for electricity All right um and uh you know high uh high income earners um have the highest benefit rating low income and racial and ethnic minorities less right and this is just asking people in the general public what do we mean just broadly construed so, so you're not you haven't given them categories of benefit just nope. whatever they think benefit means. Nope, because you know, whatever they think benefit means, um, under the assumption um, that you know what we're interested in is just a broad characterization of benefits as stratified by these different groups, right? Um, we could drill into more particular things if we if if one could. This is just showing that the public picks up on the earlier observational work that showed some inequity in terms of access. That's all we're trying to accomplish here. <laughs> okay, so that perception is out there. Um, now, before going into looking at sort of willingness to contribute, um, I want to pause and show you something uh, to, sh to say that this isn't completely silly. Who here um, has heard of Schedule Z? Anyone heard of Schedule Z? Have you heard of Schedule Z? See, that's, that's telling. Like the... The, the energy guru, okay, or an energy guru. Um, so what is Schedule Z? In the state of Massachusetts, it turns out that you can donate your electricity credits to someone else's energy bill. You can actually do this. You are all very smart people. Um, none of you have ever even heard of this, okay? Let's say the utility company doesn't really talk about this much. Now, um, notice what this program though does, it's you are donating energy credits essentially to someone else's bill, but that person could be um, uh, consuming any number of energy sources, right? It's just going at the bill level. It's not going to the actual production. So someone's energy could be driven by in this region, natural gas, in all likelihood, that's the marginal provider. Um, so it's literally just giving someone else a discount on their bill. And all I'm doing is saying, ah, that's good. We can think about inequity or something like that, but what if we were just take that money and to plow it into investing in renewable infrastructure that would perpetually 
generate energy rather than just be a one-off discount. So this exists. Um, first of all, it's in a PDF form. So you know already that it's not going to be a fun experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got Carrie Jenks in the room. So we've got, you know, the lawyers, you know, this is going to have some legalese here and uh, uh, it's going through. And then here's all oh, the standards for interconnection of distributed generation. And uh, by nameplate capacity, this means Oh man, and uh, these pages, and we're keep, all right, if a, a neighborhood, I, ISO any load zone, are you in an ISO any load zone? How many of you, okay, <laughs> all right, keep going here, oh, oh more standards, okay, now, uh, uh, allowing net metering credits to fewer than 50 eligible accounts, skip to item G, I think you get the point. What's on the previous 153 pages? <laughs> it's uh so the point being this is complicated um uh and uh so i was googling around and um there's a, actually a firm named resonant energy that's in the area um and resonant energy has something called the um, solar equity program it's a really interesting program you're someone's nodding their head you, you've actually heard of this yeah there's a couple other okay cool all right so this is really neat so I'm like, all right, what are they up to? Literally all they were doing is making it a lot easier for people to participate in that program by like setting up a digital interface and doing a couple other things that I'll talk about in a couple minutes, right? And they're actually having a lot of the success, right? I brought them into a class that I was teaching um, undergrad um, and the students loved it. It was just like, you know, can I come work for you, right? But they're a small, you know, they're a small company, right? Um, so this stuff is out there. It turns out, Joe, it's not that weird, right? Uh, uh, and so uh, what does this look like? Okay, so we said, all right, let's, let's do some, you know, willingness to pay. Now, um, if you will, willingness to donate. So in a survey, we um, asked people whether they had interest in solar or not, because that might be a sort of a big driver of sort of willingness here. Um, uh, and then asked if you had $20 per month in net metering proceeds that you could donate um, to low income uh, communities for the purpose of building solar, what would you do? Okay. Um, and so we just scale this in terms of percentages. And these are just, uh, I guess they're called violin plots, but that, this doesn't look like a violin I've ever seen. Um, and uh, we broke it out by their, what they themselves uh, said they would do. And then we asked what they thought their neighbors would do. And the reason we did that was, you know, a, a general concern that like, you know, Joe's going to say he's way more altruistic than he actually is. But there's literature that shows that if you ask about a sort of a second party, um, you're going to reduce some of that. Okay. Um, and we weren't in a world, this is just running surveys. I'm, I was not, nor did I have the budget to do an experiment of the form an actual like um, revealed preference rather than stated preference exercise, okay? Um, and so amongst people um, uh, with no solar interest, they would uh, said about 27% uh, um, of that $20 that they would be willing to donate. Um, and uh, amongst people who had solar interest, 37%, it going down to 22%, okay? So clearly people are keeping some of the money. Um, and, uh, or the credits here, and that totally makes sense. Like there is an upfront capital cost to do this stuff, right? When you're making this decision. Right now we live in a world though, where we've, we're just giving people binaries, right? You either can pay back all of your investment um, or, um, uh, or, or not, right? And so this is just giving people a mechanism to distribute some percentage, right? Um, and so, you know, 22%, so that's about four bucks, four bucks a month of that. And we stipulated $20 just to kind of give something concrete, right? Because the amount of net metering will depend on a variety of factors, okay? Um, so that was, that was interesting. Um, in the paper, we do all sorts of things about like, okay, what people would donate more, less, you know, using pre-treatment, you know, or sort of pre-allocation um, covariates that we collected about people. Um, so then that gets us, all right, so that's, a, you know, people are in the ballpark here, they're willing to play. Um, how do then do we 
use different behavioral design components. Um, the one that I just hinted at, which we, we don't study directly, um, is that um, you know, our colleague Cass Sudstein and, and, and Thaler have this notion of sludge, right? Where you just make it really hard for someone to do something like that PDF form, you're gonna just turn off participation, right? And so like first order, the things that resonant energy is doing with our SEP, pro, SEP, like that's super important, right? Like if you make someone go through a long PDF and, um, and it's very inflexible and not, people aren't gonna like it. But what about some other things? What about um, loss aversion? Um, uh, what about how responsive are people to saying, well, this would go to poor communities versus some other community, right? That people have what's known as inequity aversion. Um, what's the role of social pressure? Right, that if Joe is participating in this program, right, he's my neighbor, is that gonna sort of have some impact on me? Um, what would the role of sort of fund matching or tax credits or any number of things that we could sort of bake into a process? Like how would that actually move the needle um, at all? And then finally thinking about the broader sort of institutional arrangements that occur between communities, government and utilities, um, what would that do in terms of having an impact on program participation, right? So again, these are all just things that are, you know, out there in the sort of social science literature, like how do we design programs? And then we're just going to look at um, the way in which it could um, um, impact uh, some of these, uh, uh, these decisions. Um, so I'm going to go through um, some of the ways that we look at this and some of the motivation for it. So one of the things we did is we ran a, a conjoint survey. Now conjoints, um, let me just kind of uh, explain um, what that is. So um, conjoints were first developed in the um, consumer marketing literature to figure out if there are different ways that you could describe or construct some thing that something would buy. Um, here I'm holding up a can, that's a pink grapefruit. I love these spindrifts. Um, and uh, so a conjoint survey would do something like, I'm gonna present you with two options and which one would you choose, right? And those options are gonna vary along a set of dimensions, right? So like how big is the can? Is the can uh, pink? Uh, uh, what's the flavor? Like the lemon spindrift suck, the grapefruit, amazing, right? So, and how much, and, and so you, like, which would you choose between two choices? Um, there's also um, ones that are more like, well, then what's your willingness to pay? Right? And so this style of survey has become popular um, in uh, fields like political science, um, uh, uh, you know, likely in economics. Um, uh, so people do things like, I'm gonna just describe political candidates along these different dimensions, and then you choose which political candidate you would vote for, okay? So um, we're gonna use a design like this, where we just describe different programs and then have people choose between those. And where the different dimensions we're going to randomly manipulate such that we can back out the sort of average causal effect of that dimension compared to a baseline. Right? And so that's how this is gonna work. So you can think about a conjoint for those of you who um, have a little bit more statistics training, a conjoint is like a multifactorial experiment uh, and you kind of cluster your standard errors. Right? Um, and so, uh, you know, the dimensions that we considered in this particular conjoint, we couldn't load it up with everything because there's a sort of a limit, a cognitive limit on these things. Additional tax credits um, for donation recipient, um, uh, federal tax credit for solar installation, um, the target community, um, community member participation, the solar project type, and your average um, solar yearly profit okay, from net metering. Right? And so all these things are just relevant dimensions for this choice. Uh, and so the way this works, you're going to have this choice task repeated a couple of times. Right? Um, I'm paying you to take the survey, so I'm going to extract every bit of um, information out of you as I can. Um, so people would see this um, each time uh, with ra new randomly assigned values um, in these. Um, uh, and then we're going to have them choose which do you prefer and then um, actually have an allocation decision. I'm just gonna do a, what is the effect on your choosing the program? Um, but the, um, the results are similar. Um, so uh, this is what um, 
uh, the kind of format of the result to look like, where we can, you know, it's, this is essentially using a linear probability model, we can estimate um, compared to a baseline, which one sets, in this case, um, no other community members are, are participating. If 30%, if you're told 30% of your community is also participating in this program, it would increase the probability that you would select that option by 7%. Right, so that's the sort of way to think about this. Um, and, uh, you know, consistent with the social pressure literature, you know, we see uh, an increasing trend there. Okay. Um, uh, and then we can go through and look at these different, um, at these different dimensions. Um, so uh, you can look at um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, if the recipients are going to get um, a tax, like a matching tax credit on the recipient side, what's that going to do um, compared to nothing? Um, or if, um, if we're, we're, we have uh, tax credits for you to actually install solar to begin with, which is something that we have now, again, this is complementary to programs that we already have out in the ether. Um, this is what we get. Um, the focus, uh, we also said, well, what about let's, let's change like who the target is. Right. Um, I was particularly interested in like, well, as a, as a part of like my earlier work, like what if we could like build broader political coalitions by saying some of this goes to fossil communities? Um, turns out that was not very popular. OK, um, but low income, certainly. Right. So um, certainly something here about inequity. This effect on a negative effect of black, brown and indigenous there was a lot of heterogeneities in that effect by pretreatment covariates. And the paper talks about some of um, these. I'm not gonna unpack it here today. Um, so you could imagine, you know, broadly speaking, how Republicans versus Democrats respond to these experimental manipulations. Um, there's a question in the back. Yeah. When you did low income, was that generic or was that low income and affordable in your own community? Yeah, so um, uh, it, we just, your con uh, the question is, was this um, uh, just low income or was it a more specific, like low income in directly in your community? We just said low income. And it was just in part, I mean, I kid you not, the number of dimensions that you can manipulate here, but also the fact, and this is kind of embarrassing, most people take these surveys on their cell phones now. <laughs> and so you have to keep your sort of word prompts extremely limited, but uh, your intuition that local uh, low income might be more desirable than just sort of anywhere. And so if anything, you know, the, the hypothesis would be that this would get pushed up even further if it were more localized. At least I, I think that would be consistent with what other literature says. Um, you know, certainly um, if you're making more money um, uh, to begin with, you're more willing to contribute more. Okay. So people are both in equity inversion and <laughs> respond to sort of the background sort of opportunity cost. Um, and then this was, um, what was the solar project type, right? Um, and we contrasted between taking this money and, and helping local business set up their own renewable um, versus a solar field for the entire community or individual households, which were, um, had the most impact. Um, schools did as well. And this is something actually you're seeing a lot of a movement on about uh, installing solar panels in schools for a variety of sort of uh, procedural reasons. Um, uh, interestingly, one of the big areas that uh, um, resident energy has had a lot of luck with is people um, being willing to donate for um, building solar for places of worship. Um, uh, in their experience, that's they've been very successful um, for that. We didn't quite, we did not observe that in our sample here, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, then you know, we could ask some follow-up questions about, like, okay, well, what were the most important attributes um, here? Um, you know, around like the uh, target community, um, and just a sort of a ranking exercise. Um, so. Uh, there's an algorithm you can do to give like optimal list um, aggregation um, that, you know, for some interesting results. 
Um, I'm going to skip over this just mindful of time because I want to get to loss aversion. So um, before we uh, ran some of these surveys, I kind of pitched to, you know, your sort of friends of the family and like what we were doing. Um, and uh, one person uh, who's a retired political scientist said, you know what, like the problem with all of this is that, yeah, like in some months I could be net metering, but in other months, like we live in the Northeast, Dustin, I might be having to pay for energy and that would kill my interest in this, right? Um, and so they were thinking along like a yearly budget cycle, whereas like what we, I was describing before is like how much are you gonna donate monthly? Um, and uh, so uh, we thought about this and, um, and in fact, it turns out resident energy has this, essentially a group of sort of more data science people where for a given client who might be willing to donate their energy credits, they basically figure out how much you should be donating such that you're never in the red, right? That you're never in a world where you're actually having to buy energy, right? And they do all sorts of seasonal forecasting, so on and so forth. Um, and so inspired by that, we had the idea that you could, in a sense, set up a net metering bank, right? So if you are in a world and, and your home in Massachusetts might not be in it, um, but if you're in a world uh, where um, you're generating net metering proceeds, um, you build up a bank to cover you when you're not net metering, right? Um, such that once you have that a sufficient bank set up, right? Once you have a sufficient bank set up, then you're going to donate additional proceeds on top of that. So we're actually going to use a bank to like smooth out so that you never have to pay for energy. Right. But then once you have a sufficient bank set up, then you get to donate on top of that. Right. And so that was the mechanism that we designed to counter this sort of loss aversion type uh, concern. Um, and so we ran an experiment where we described that net metering bank and then the control condition, which was um, you're not going to be protected against losses. Right. You don't have the net metering bank. And then look at things like donation size, so on and so forth. Um, so across a range of outcome variables, um, we observed a, a positive causal effect in the experiment. Um, however, uh, you'll note I'm putting here the complier average causal effect because as one might imagine, um, we certainly had respondents in our survey that did not comprehend what the hell this was about. <laughs> And so we actually had a post-treatment question that asked them, do you ever expect under this program to have to be paying for additional energy? And we subset the analysis on the people who understood that under this program, they would not have to do this, okay? So that is an important kind of econometric distinction. We are, you know, it, which is just to say, if you were to ever roll out a program like this, you'd have to make it a lot more easily understood how that bank works than even I was able to convey um, to you today. Um, but nonetheless, there was certainly about countering um, that concern about uh, a loss aversion, just given this, the nature, the seasonality of uh, some of these things. Um, so uh, next, um, we thought about the effects of attitudes on uh, about power companies and just said, you know, if your power company offered the solar energy donation program, which we had already previously introduced to people, right? So they knew what it was versus did not, what would your, um, how would you look at them uh, in terms of a standard favorability rating? Um, and here we see pretty large effects, right? Um, so this is just the treatment indicator itself. You're on a one to four point scale. You're literally moving people almost a whole increment, right? Um, and in this type of work, um, uh, that's pretty big, okay? Um, we looked at different heterogeneities and what might further sort of moderate that effect. It's not the point of the presentation today, but the point is to the utility companies, like, hey, if you were to think about programs like this, it might help you with your some of your visibly low um, PR ratings, right? Um, again, just trying to think about making things like this instead of compatible for both sides, 
um, rather than um, this is just something that do-gooders want to do and utility companies, please, uh, please do this. Um, finally, we, we wanted to explore this sort of polycentric idea, which is to say for programs like these, um, if they're only implemented by like a single organization versus having a broader sort of cross-section of stakeholders that are involved in this, um, what would that what would that impact be, right? And so you could think like, oh, well, maybe the power company should just do this, or maybe the state government should do this, or maybe we, both of those should do this with communities uh, working together. Like, so for example, one thing that came up in just interviews that we've done with people is like, I really want communities and some of the um, places that are gonna be recipients of these funds, for them to be identifying what are the sorts of projects and where would those projects be built, right? Um, to have sort of stakeholder input on that side, right? They just felt that that was very important for making programs like this be successful. Um, and so uh, uh, we then asked people along, um, you know, different goals of getting people to sign up on help on whether low income communities would actually be helped or making solar more widely available. Um, how successful would such a program be, right? Um, and so um, across all of these, you know, just having the power company, you know, be involved was like a thumbs up. That's, that's pretty good, right? Not having the power company involved would mean you probably get more of that sludge, right? Maybe it would be inefficient. Maybe they'd litigate it, you know, who knows? Um, but adding in these other components, um, you know, helped quite a bit. Um, and so... Um, you know, this brings you to, you know, in some senses, like the, the harder part of all of this, which is, well, how would you implement this, right? And I, you know, and this is when, you know, this is like completely, first of all, it was sort of a weird idea, just sort of, right? Um, it's also, you know, people ask like, well, do you think this is the thing that's going to solve the climate crisis? And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> right? This is just, you know, can we reimagine things a little bit? Like, how do we, you know, this is, this is in the tinkering side of things, right? Um, but in a way that could in principle scale. I just want to be clear about that. So there's all sorts of things about, you know, how would you partner with communities, power companies, and governments to do this, right? Um, uh, there are certainly um, insulation cost barriers. How do you exactly deal with that, right? Um, do you basically design a program such that someone recovers their installation costs first, but then it defaults into, they can opt out, the defaults into them participating and they set like how much they want to contribute, right? So you could think about kind of the mechanism design there. Um, what does this look like for renters, right? There are plenty of renters that might be interested in installing, um, but that faces its own host of uh, challenges. Um, there's a whole stock of, I'm gonna crudely call general equilibrium effects, but I'll, I'll, I'll just like give you an example of this. Our utility companies do run programs um, and some of them are incentivized uh, due to sort of federal regulations to reduce the cost of energy for the poor. This is something that Eversource and NSTAR and whatnot does. Now of note, it is reducing the cost of energy for the purchase of the marginal power plant, which is natural gas, right? So I hope hoping to kind of push on that. What if this sort of thing would crowd out they're doing that? And then the net outcome would actually be worse for the precisely the same types of communities that we're thinking about helping here. So that is what I mean by like a, really thinking through the general equilibrium effects of things like this. Now, it need not happen that way, right? Um, but it certainly could. And it's the sort of thing that um, in doing this type of tinkering, we should be mindful of. Um, but regardless, um, this is a, a more ground up model that offers a path for durable solutions that address energy security and uh, at some level, the climate crisis. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dustin. We'll take uh, some questions now. Um, I guess the first question that I'd like to ask, when we thought about some of the challenges of building out solar, 
in uh, low income communities, especially communities which have large uh, renter populations. The idea of sort of community solar has been thought of as sort of a way to try to address this. You've got a different kind of mechanism here. You're, you're, you're focusing on, on a financing mechanism that I think is much broader than what I typically think of in the context of community solar. But I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of a sense of, as we're trying to sort of share the benefits of solar to uh, more communities, how does this compare with say, the emerging model that's out there? And I think there's some variation, but the emerging model on community solar. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, it's actually precisely why we embedded community solar as one of the dimensions of that conjoint mindful of that and even though like we see like a very similar effect between the two of these in like a public opinion sample if i were to be designing this program i would focus the the implementation possibilities for this as well as your ability to get at scale like the scale economies you get with community solar compared to the infrastructure costs and all the materials that you need for rooftop like i would put all my ducats in that one for sure and so I think it's very, this broader financing model is very complementary with that approach. And it's just to say like, are we really building enough community solar right now? Probably not. I go even one step further. And again, like experts such as yourself would have better insights here. Um, but at some level, I don't really care where the solar is built. Like an electron is an electron is an electron. And so even if the sort of solar field that is off somewhere more distant within the utilities territory um, is producing electrons that go to whomever, as long as the sort of cost savings are going to the community that was being targeted, I don't care, right? Like at a total sort of 1,000 foot perspective. I think there is something though of building community solar such that people in that community can see it, that it can be part of the sort of um, you know, uh, it can provide shade or, you know, who knows the number of co-benefits that can come with that. That would push me a little bit more here. The build it anywhere thing is just what we know about sort of efficiency and scale. That's how I would think about it. Other questions? Thank you, Dustin. Uh, this is kind of a naive question, but why do you think the utilities would care to be viewed more favorably? <laughs> well, here we actually have revealed preference data, which is that the utility companies spend money on that. So they seem to care. Um, certainly when they are also having to go into negotiations with like, public utility commissions, et cetera, if, you know, if, if they have a more favorable rating, if they can say that they're doing proactive things that help underserved communities, those things resonate. Um, I see Carrie like nodding her head that like. I have a great question. Like they're starting, if, if they're coming in and raising rates, if they can show that they've benefited the community in a way that there's only, only one way to go. Yeah, it's only, only upside. Now, how much upside, you know, again, this is tinkering. Right? Are there other things that they could be doing? Um, but yeah, I think there's I think there's a play here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dustin. Really fascinating. Um, I'm wondering whether you've thought about a kind of a roundabout solution to kind of avoid the utilities um, leveraging this growing space of grid optimization players. Um, I was having a conversation with someone who works at a place called Ohm Energy, um, where they're incentivizing residential consumers to reduce their load at different periods of time through kind of vouchers and things, and then they're selling capacity back onto the grid. With this innovative idea of kind of having a metering bank, then this might be a way in which you can get more money into that bank by kind of getting those um, consumers to, you know, choose not to take the vouchers, pop it in the bank, uh, and then pay for, for a solar um, down the line. Curious if you've thought about that, and, and maybe that might be a way to get around those utilities. Um, second, didn't, maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear so much on kind of how to get over that tension that you point, pointed out at the beginning on transmission and utilities not favoring um, uh, meter uh, the net metering because of um, use of that infrastructure without um, paying back for it. I'm curious if you could elaborate a bit more on overcoming that tension. Yeah, the, both excellent questions. So 
Let me deal with, um, so I, I, um, I don't know about Ohm. I'll definitely check them out. Um, uh, I think there's a broader version of your comment that is about grid optimization that is, is in fact precisely behind California's move from NEM 2.0 to 3.0, where, I mean, total broad strokes, basically what California did is decrease the amount of net metering you can do, like the, the rates under 3.0, but also they paired it with you're having to install uh, battery storage. And the idea is essentially, A, we like help to solve some of our grid problems by having distributed, um, uh, more distributed storage, such that like if you have stored up some and then you know, uh, you're in that five to 7 p.m. region, Right, uh, where you know the solar isn't kicking quite as hard, um, you can sort of help the grid. There are some initial sort of commentary of people saying, actually, the total amount of net metering proceeds <laughs> that you can make under NEM 3.0 is greater than 2.0 because you can choose when to sell back to the grid and you can get a better price at different times of day. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a lot of gymnastics to go through in one's head, right? But that's like, that's the flavor. And so it, it is a debate, as I understand it, about like what actually will be the impact on total net metering proceeds under these different plans. Lower net metering rates during most hours, but your ability to sell back at higher rates because you have storage. You also introduce other complexities, such as like now you are having people to have to buy storage too. So your barrier to entry is changing a little bit. Um, but it is, it, it's precisely consistent with your intuition that you could pair these sorts of things with other initiatives like grid resilience, storage, the, the program that you're speaking of in complementary ways, or one would hope. Um, as to like resolving that tension um, that I articulated first, I guess like I'll give you my sort of unfiltered political science view of this, which is like we have not had as a society a real honest conversation, both amongst ourselves and utility companies about what that rate should be. And here's why. The utility companies will basically say, here's our, it's, a, it's like a two-sided, it's a, the game of incomplete information, like if I were writing down an actual model, this is the flavor of what it would look like. We cannot directly observe their actual cost of the maintenance of the distribution network that is necessary for the marginal increment that is put back onto the grid from net metering. I'm not even sure that they can really figure that out. That is a hard calculation to do. I'm sure there are clever economists that could figure out how to do it. They would then need to pair up with a smart legal team and us really figure out like, what is that cost? And furthermore, that cost could be very different depending on where you are, right? It will not be the same in Cambridge or in Lexington, Massachusetts, as it would be somewhere else for all sorts of reasons, right? In terms of infrastructure. So I think like what I, what I would hope to do is for us to just actually just be a little bit more empathetic with the utility company view, but also force the utility companies to be a little bit more transparent and proactive about pursuing programs like this. And maybe this is like kind of a sweetener that it's sort of good for both sides that we can both recognize the public benefit. Maybe that would help to sort of catalyze some of the conversation. Right now, how is it working out? It's litigation and lawsuits and public utility commissions that, um, you know, seem much more persuaded by one side than the other. So um, uh, thank you for this. Uh, my, this is somewhat related to what you were just talking about, but when I read the paper, I was uh, frustrated a little bit because I was missing the uh, what I would call a characterization of the problem associated with net metering. And if you, and if you 
look at it from a first, uh, you know, first best kind of solution. Um, when you do the solar installation, you're saving on the energy that's delivered. And then there's another part of what uh, people get charged, which is basically a tax. And the tax is to pay for all the infrastructure. Um, and that's actually where most of the money is. Um, and, um, and that tax has been litigated over the years, uh, decades, um, century, actually. <laughs> um, and it, and it, the, the basic pressure is to make it more and more progressive so that you charge rich people and people who consume a lot, a lot more than you charge poor people and you um, uh, lower their, the, the lower income cost. Then you come along, so that's the structure that we currently have. Then you come along with net metering, what does it do? It undoes the tax. And now um, you say, well, wait a minute here. <laughs> what are we, I, I thought we were trying to make it more progressive, but net, actually net metering provides all the incentives for the really rich people to get out of paying the tax. And uh, now it's going to have to be collected from somebody else. It's going to have to be collected from the people who are left under this net metering scheme. That's the poor people, you know. So it's just you know it's going all exactly. You know, so when you look at all, when you get all finished, I don't even know where it ends up as to whether or not poor people are, end up worse off or better off under all this kind of stuff. And it's completely muddled the whole conversation. And that's what worried me about the paper because the paper didn't address this problem. Yeah. I hope that my presentation characterized it a little bit more directly. Yes, it did. <laughs> uh, you can take the mic. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. Um, and, you know, I think that, look, I, I live, in, I mean, I study politics. I live in the world of second and third bests, right? Um, I, would, I would say um, uh, conditional on some system uh, enabling, uh, you know, that is to say some rate, some progressive tax of me being able to sell back that takes into account distribution, um, that whatever I'm left with, having a mechanism such that I actually can choose to do something more with that for other people rather than only retain that, then I, would, I, would, I think that is a decent world to be in. Now, if we get into a world where, um, which is the one that you are concerned with, which is where the rich people sort of bid down the distribution tax so much that it distorts things and then ultimately penalizes poor people. I completely agree, right? And I think that is where, uh, and 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 so I, you know, I think that needs to be a part of. I mean, that that is what frustrates me about reading a lot of commentary about net metering is that um, it sort of has treated the like existing utility system and the rates that are baked into this as inherently evil. And my view is like, uh, uh, I just want it like, how can we characterize those costs a little bit better? And if you want to put some nonlinear function on it, such that you get a more progressive system, et cetera, let's figure out what that is. And then still let people donate if they want to, right? If there are surpluses. And it might well be in some places that there aren't. It might well be in many parts of the country, there would not necessarily be that, right? If you bake that in. Um, but I still think it's reasonable to kind of even with that problem characterization, think that what we could do sort of on top of that. I think that's a reasonable thing to, to wonder, at least. You don't seem convinced. Well, I think the first principle is there, there are aggregate sur surpluses. I think this is social welfare reducing. So, um, so it's not that there's a somehow. Ignoring the climate experience, big problem. <laughs> But how can we make statements like that? You don't think, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's kind of awkward to say that, like, you know, there's no aggregate surplus here as long as we, like, hold aside the climate externalities, A. B, like, I don't think a, the viewpoint of communities that are basically completely underserved by, um, uh, you know, access to uh, renewable energy. I, I'm not sure that they would characterize the problem in, the, in that way. So that's that's a political question, not an economic one, right? Um, and I think there's a general move to say, like, yeah, we should actually be thinking about those sort of inequities and in access to some of these things, right? Um, having said that, I'm completely – I mean, at the end of the day, if there is, like, a great, 
welfare calculation to do that shows that we should just get rid of net metering in entirety. And this is precisely what was behind the move in NEM 3.0 to make sure that there would be storage, but to reduce the rates. A lot of these, you're, that way of thinking that you're characterizing went behind that. I'm fine with that, right? I don't think we're there yet. And, he, and even in California where people have litigated this, I mean, this was, this is heavily debated. I mean, my sense is that the new NEM 3.0 and everything that I've read, it suggests that a decrease, but not elimination of net metering um, is gonna be better for poorer communities. That is the claim, which would be consistent with your view, right? But I don't think the elimination of it necessarily is a solution. Thank you so much, Professor Tingley. Very interesting. Um, I'm just curious about one thing. I saw that one of the most positive correlations was when uh, people said that they, when the program was set to build uh, solar for the entire community. And I think that corroborates a lot with um, what we've been seeing. I've heard other speakers say that local politics and, and often there are protests about renewable energy deployment. Even in Iceland, where I'm from, you have environmentalists protesting windmills because they're like, we don't see any benefit in this. You know, it's just going to go to the aluminum company or something. Um, but I'm curious if a program like this would um, do such a thing as building solar for the entire community, who would own such a thing and where would the benefits of that go to? I'm, I'm curious because in the 70s when renewable energy was being deployed in Iceland, it was mostly local municipalities of like towns of 200 people that were um, getting relatively risk-free loans from the government and that helped them a lot. And so I'm thinking, you know, you talk about a bank of some sorts, but could this also be a bank towards building um, you know, solar that serves the entire community and, and then that community can sell to the next community and hopefully benefit them also in deploying renewable energy. Yeah, so I'm gonna start at the end of your question and work my way forward. I didn't present it today, but we have an experiment in the paper that we call like the virtuous flywheel experiment. And uh, there the treatment condition was um, the community that receives these funds however constructed, right? I'm leaving out a lot of details that would make like actual implementation people crazy, but you know, um, that any net metering that they do would have to be either reinvested into more renewable capacity within their community or go to another uh, low income community, right? So you see like the kind of flywheel of like I, one investment just leads to more investments, right? And that was just like, people love that. I would say that's probably the most positive effect in the paper. Um, it just, you know, takes a little, some mental gymnastics to, to go through. Um, you know, who actually would own these resources? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I mean, who, I mean, there's one characterization, which is we shouldn't be doing this at all. Let's just assume, <laughs> I get to make assumptions now. Um, let's just assume that, uh, that we do do this. Um, you could have it, you know, it, it could be done at the muni municipal level. Um, you could set up particular, or, or you could even take advantage of existing community organizations that have a particular nonprofit status, including a nonprofit tax status, um, that they could be the owners. Um, quite frankly, there could be a world where it's sort of a, something a little bit more of a hybrid, where the utility company is actually involved. Like go through the version where I was like, I don't really care where you build the additional solar, right? You let the utility company decide as long as like the generated electricity is going to offset the uh, energy costs of those communities. So I'm not sure. Um, there's all sorts of like dances that you have to do in this space around the tax status of different ent entities because you're involving donations, right? Um, uh, and so the, there's, there, and I, that's not a world that I know enough about. So uh, a comment and a question. So the comment is, I would have thought that the answer uh, or in your exchange with Bill uh, about what the sort of the socially optimal starting point would be, uh, would be uh, that electricity, the kilowatt hours are priced at the social marginal cost, which is going to presumably be time of day. 
pricing. Uh, and then there's a pretty big fee for connection and you can make that fee uh, uh, income dependent or something. So that's just a two part tariff uh, strategy. Um, and then in that situation, then net metering solves itself and requirements to have batteries solve itself because you know, you're going to put batteries on so you can sell spend, back when you sell want sell back to. when it's expensive. Right. Yep. The, the question is, in a lot of states, <clears throat> there are binding renewable portfolio standards. And if you have a binding renewable portfolio standard, then a mechanism like this that might operate within a state might change the cost of financing relative across different types of projects, but it's not going to actually expand the number of, of uh, megawatts of solar that are out there. And how do we think about that? this in, in that context? Yeah. Um, I like your response to Bill. <laughs> All right. Time of use is, is a term of art, which is actually uh, it's, that's anti time of use is the way it's used. Yeah. You don't okay. want. But. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Jim, your question really boils down to additionality, yeah. right? Uh, which additionality in the is the world of counterfactuals and is uh, is hard. Um, I have not thought about the constraints on additionality that an RPS would induce. Um, and you know, if indeed that was a concern, I wonder what distortions you would introduce by saying that things like this could not count towards the standard, right? From like a policy lever perspective. That would be one like off the cuff thought. And I, I don't, I'd have to think through what distortions that would induce. Um, you know, certainly in the, you know, I know the context of Iowa a lot better in terms of RPS and there it was much more like much more large, larger scale installations by large companies, not residential. Um, and so it seems like at least the legislative prerogative behind RPS in states like that was pretty orthogonal to the populations I'm talking about here. But nonetheless, the point is taken to, you know, it, it's, it is, the additionality question is very related to the sort of broader characterization of what would the general equilibrium effects of this stuff be, right? And, and I, which I flagged and it was just like, that world is hard. I just want to indicate that I'm at least smart enough to be able to say the two words. Uh, so let me make a couple of quick comments before uh, we wrap up. First on this topic, I, I think one, it has implications on the politics since a lot of it is the utilities that have the RPS obligations. And maybe if you enable this to be one way in which they could comply with the RPS, maybe this actually makes them more inclined uh, than they would be otherwise to support such an approach. Second, I think you can, as Jim alluded to, just exclude some of this. My recollection, but I may be wrong, is in California with the CSI, the California Solar Initiative, uh, if you were a, a homeowner who claimed a subsidy for that, you could not then generate credits for compliance with the state RPS. So you just sort of make some of these rules to try to, try to avoid uh, that problem. Second comment, I would make is um, as, as an economist who's done both stated preference and revealed preference, I could say uh, what's great about stated preference is it gives us an idea on where to go forward with future revealed preference research, see how much actions in practice actually reflect what people are saying in these surveys. Um, we're about to spend a bajillion dollars uh, on solar, among other things. And, you know, for example, EPA has this greenhouse gas reduction fund. Some of it, I think 7 billion is a solar for all initiative. They're actually trying to target specific communities to build out solar. There's also efforts among academics to try to think through how they might partner with local governments to implement like through RCTs to learn. And it could be that some of this when we talk about durability is that EPA has 18 months to spend $27 billion. Actually, I think they have to actually appropriate, they have to actually allocate those monies to state and local governments. 
and then there's time to sort of roll that out. But one could imagine that some of this might be a complement to this big infusion of cash. And maybe that's what you make, how you make this durable is get this kind of community buy-in even once those federal dollars are gone. But there may be ways to think about, you know, trying to be creative, partnering with some of these groups. And I can chat with you later, Dustin, about who I've been talking to about this, about how one might be able to test out some of these ideas through some of these newly funded federal programs, but are getting implemented at the state and local level. Um, final thing before, final comment before we wrap up, uh, we'll meet again at noon Monday next week, back at the other room. Apologies for some who started there and then migrated here. We'll be back in Rubenstein 414. Uh, next Monday, we'll have Fran Moore of uh, UC Davis joining us. She'll be speaking on the social cost of carbon. And finally, please join me in thanking Dustin Tingley for his insights today. Thank you so much. Thank you.